<laughs> Works that way your whole life. <laughs> Mr. Charlie, there you are. Good morning. Gentiles, and so he was, uh, even though he himself, by his own testimony, was uh, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, he, um, he considered himself, uh, and he had, a per he had a personal burden for Israel, um, he uh, was called by God, uh, by Christ specifically, to be uh, an apostle uh, to the Gentiles, to evangelize them, uh, to be able to share with them, and not only about who Christ was, but also to instruct them. And also, he was foundational as a pillar uh, in the establishing of the New Testament church, what we find as, as being the, the local church. Um, but this is just a small insight into how he would approach uh, his fellow uh, brethren according to the flesh and how he um, I, I believe this is something that's very helpful this is pretty interesting because we see instances throughout the book of Acts after he's saved as far as he goes out and he proclaims but uh, this actually gives an insight into his methodology and then you see the results of it uh, as well so starting at chapter uh, 17 verse 1 it says, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was the synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, and opening alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And then the results of that we see in verse 4. It says, uh, And some of them believed, sorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks, uh, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. So in other words, there's a lot of folks that were born again as a result. We see persecution that's going to follow them, beginning in verse 5 all the way to about verse 10, and then he's set to Berea. But um, you had a number of folks end up being born again as a result of, I guess you could say, his. well, basically what he did was he just proclaimed Christ. This is interesting. And I know this kind of goes without saying, and this is pretty much common sense, but it's just interesting how the, the Holy Spirit annotates it for us. So our first thing is that reasoning, in our own reasoning, opening, and alleging must take place. Right? 
And so we see that in Paul's manner, I guess you could say, whenever he would come in. So he reasons with them, but he reasons with them in particular from the scriptures. We see that in verse 2. And then he reasons with them concerning a few things uh, from out of the scriptures. Since he's dealing in particular with uh, Jews that are religious, that are observant, uh, seeking to be faithful, uh, they are waiting for... They're waiting for... I'm sorry, I should do that. They're waiting for Messiah, right? So what is their expectation of Messiah? That they're looking for. What are they expecting him to do right then? You mean? Yeah. They were well. They were expecting him to start to establish the kingdom at the point right after he descended. Is that the, is that, is that the answer to the question? What? Well, yes. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, they expected him to free them from the Romans. That's another good point too. Israel's climate overall was weak. Well, you know what? Go, uh, go back to... Matthew 16 and verse 13. Okay, when Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I am, or I the Son of Man am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, or Elijah, and others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And then Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now we don't catch this necessarily because it's no, it from it, granted, it is a Jewish perspective, but as far as he's he's the Messiah. Okay, you're you're the one that's been promised. Uh, he's when he mentions that he's the Son of God, that's specifically referencing prophecy, not just the fact. Okay, yeah, you're Christ. You're the you're the Anointed One that's to come. You're Messiah coming, but you're also the, the Son of the Living God, referencing back not only Isaiah seven and also Isaiah nine. That unto you know that uh, a, a child's going to be born, a son given, and then the government's going to be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called you know Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So he's, he's particularly referencing the fact, okay, you're you're God Almighty, you're prophesied, you're Messiah. And then uh, here's Jesus' response says, and Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto you are unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, and that's specifically referencing himself, Christ. In other words, it's not, it's not talking about Peter being the rock, how the Catholic Church always say he's the first pope, but rather it's, it's the testimony that Christ is Messiah, and that Christ himself is the, the rock. Um, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Uh, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Okay, and then, then charge ye the disciples that they should not tell, uh, that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Okay, and then now beginning from this point forward in his ministry, he says, from that time forth, Jesus began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised again the third day. Now mind you, is this the first time that that has been mentioned at all? As far as in scripture, that Jesus was going to suffer those things, that those things were going to be fallen? It's not the first time. No. no. <laughs> I mean, you got tons of prophecy beforehand that mentioned about you know, the Messiah would be cut off, but not for his sins, but it would be for the sins of the people. Uh, you know, and, and then he specifically, you know, would mention about, you know, if, you know, tear the tear this tabernacle down, tear, the, tear this temple down, and then I'll raise it again in three days. And he's referencing the, about his body. And then there's, there's countless others. 
Uh, and then we see this is um, this is this is Jesus' response to that, or not Jesus? This is Peter's response to that. In verse twenty-two it says that Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, "Be it far from me, Lord; this shall not be unto thee." Okay. Uh, so Peter says, "No, this is not going to happen. No way. You know how are we going to let this happen? You." He just finished declaring, "Hey, you're Messiah. You know, you're the one that's been prophesied." And what do we know about Messiah in particular? Yes, from prophecy. He has to die. Yeah. Yeah, he has to die. Yeah, but he must, but he must need suffer. But in particular, what they were looking for was he's coming to restore a kingdom. He's coming to be able to go ahead and free Jerusalem and free Israel overall as a nation and have them be, you know, as what they were intended to be, basically, you know, God on earth ruling from there. And they would not only would be liberated, but and then it would bring in uh, great abundance to the kingdom because there are many promises and then that's something that they've been looking for constantly and looking towards constantly so now he mentions the fact now this isn't new information okay now he began to emphasize this at this point but this isn't new information to them as far as the fact that because there's prophecy going back many hundreds of years as far as the fact that uh, even thousands of years that Messiah was going to have to suffer and be cut off and he says no be it far from thee um, opening and alleging and the reasoning taking place concerning not only it's it, it's done from the scriptures right but it's done concerning Messiah's suffering the reason why is because as, as you mentioned okay they wanted to and as you mentioned as well that they're looking for somebody to come in and liberate them somebody to come in and, and uh, he's going to be the great deliverer the great rescuer he's going to come in but he's not why would he suffer how can that be uh, so it, you need to be able to bring forth from Scripture convincingly as far as that it's been pretty much settled. He was going to suffer. He was going to die. But he wasn't going to remain dead. He would rise again from the dead three days later. We see that in 1 Corinthians 15 that uh, not only that he, would, he died according to Scriptures, but he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So Christ had prophesied also the fact that he wouldn't remain dead. You know, um, he would not... Let that holy one see corruption, is in, in the Psalms that we're told. Uh, as a prophecy referencing the fact that Messiah would not remain dead, but he, he would rise up again. And then that by his offering, which is he, he would give his life, uh, that the many would be able to be reconciled unto God. And so, opening and alleging, the reasoning must take place. Uh, now, the word reasoning there. Um, goes without saying is it, literally it's dialogue dialoguing okay and so what you're doing is you're interacting with a person this goes without saying our second point here is that readiness of mind is crucial uh, to receptivity of the gospel and that goes with anybody it's not just specific to Jewish evangelism but that's just any evangelism whatsoever that you do if a person's not open in their head as far as they're not clear-headed they're not open to be able to receive information, then it's going to be kind of difficult to be able to get anything through to them. Uh, we see, go down to verse 10 uh, in chapter 17 of Acts. Uh, Acts 17, verse 10. This is something also, uh, so the Jews had, the unbelieving Jews that were jealous or they were envious, they uh, stirred up a commotion in town there at Thessalonica. So Paul was let out, uh, let out of town. And it says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. And now this is a commentary on the Jews there at Berea, at that particular synagogue. So these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and in search of scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Now, did it mention what he actually did there? No, he just it just says that he received the that they received the word. Um, it would be kind of understood that he basically would follow have followed the same pattern that he did in Thessalonica, and that he came in unto them, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, 
and then he did two things in particular. Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen from the dead, and then it says that, and this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. Okay, so there's two things that they needed convinced of. First off, Messiah was actually going to have to suffer, and he would have to rise again from the dead. That was actually crucial and necessary. Uh, that it wasn't just the fact that Messiah is going to come down, he's been prophesied, and then he's going to go ahead and deliver Israel, but it's absolutely crucial and necessary that he must have suffered and died, and that he would rise again from the dead. And then the other thing is that once you're convinced of that, hey, this Jesus that I'm preaching unto you, he's Messiah. So first off, just the concept of the fact that Messiah actually has to suffer and has to die. Now, how is that possible if he's God? How does God die? Part man. He's part man. True. His <laughs> physical, so he would, he would, his, his soul would separate from his body. That's, death, death is a separation. It's, that's literally what that is. Um, but how does God, being three in one, like, separate from himself? Honestly, I don't have an answer for that. I just know he did. And we have to take that by faith. Okay, I wish I had an answer for you for that as far as how does God die? Yeah. You got the father turn his back on the son and then he cries out, you know, why hast thou forsaken me? You know what happened. You know, it's a historical fact. Then you had not only the recorded account of what transpired, but even then you have... Um, it seemed like the heavens and the earth actually kind of went together to give testimony of the fact the sun went dark, you had the earthquake, uh, of the witnesses that were there in, in the recorded accounts that you see, it was pretty noticeable. You even have the centurion that was there at the feet of the cross uh, cried out or basically believed on the Lord Jesus after he was, after you know he had given up the ghost. Truly this was the son of God. Uh, as, as was his declaration. Uh, but as to how that takes place, it's kind of like trying to explain the Trinity <laughs> to me. I don't know how to do that. I just know Scripture gives a uh, very clear testimony of the fact that God is triune, and we take it by faith. So how does God die? God separate from himself? You have to take it by faith. Uh, it really as with anything. Um, but the fact is, he must needs have suffered, and then risen from the dead. He didn't stay dead. He didn't stay separated. And then also the fact that now that we've already established and uh, got this uh, concept across that Christ was going to have to suffer, die, and uh, rise from the dead, Jesus is Messiah. And here's why. And then you would go down and you, that's actually a lot easier. Well, actually, they're both, they're actually, they're both not that difficult. But the readiness of mind is crucial in their being able to take in. Uh, here's what God says about it. It says that these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind. God considered the fact that they had a readiness of mind to be able to receive what was instructed them uh, as something that was great. To, he counted it. The, the word noble there is uh, like basically of good good standing. It's eugenics, actually. It's like the word eugenic. But it's, it's, it says it, it, they're very uh, distinguished, obviously. Um, here's the other thing about it. In verse 12, it says that, Therefore many of them believed, also of the honorable women, uh, which were Greeks, and of men not a few. This is interesting. How many unbelievers do you come across that have enough of a grasp of the scripture to be able to go ahead and search it daily to see whether or not those things are so, and even have a respect for the word of God to actually not only know how to handle it, but actually believe it? No, you know. These were unbelievers. I don't know how many of y'all have. I mean, I've, I've attended, I was a member of two different churches, uh, not at the same time, but like uh, when I lived in Atlanta for a little bit, there was a church I, uh, my church home there, 
Berean Baptist Church, and the same thing when I was in Shelby, North Carolina. Uh, church I went there there that I was a member of. So I served that uh, name Berean as well, and I get, I, they take they took that name because of the fact that they were they they had a readiness of mind and they searched the scriptures daily. But here's the interesting thing: they weren't saved. Those people that had that attitude and that mindset and that approach as far as to the scripture weren't even saved. Uh, it's because of that that they believed, you know, or because they had that kind of attitude and mindset towards not only what was uh, taught them, uh, but towards the Word of God, as far as they had enough of respect to the Word of God that they said, you know, this is truth. Now, how a person can have that kind of respect towards the Word of God uh, and be able to have enough capacity, uh, <coughs> enough knowledge to be able to go ahead and handle it, to be able to go ahead and search to know where to look as to see whether or not this is true or not and still not be saved is kind of like a dilemma to me. It's possible, obviously, because these were, so it's possible that you run across people that are religious, uh, that are maybe devout. They'd be like a Cornelius uh, in Acts 10 that he gave alms and he prayed daily and then God said, okay, you know, your alms and your prayers have come up as a remembrance before me. And so he sends, uh, he, well, he basically tells him that I'm going to send somebody to, to come to you, a gentleman by the name of Peter. I'm going to have you go seek him out, and then he's going to come in and tell you more about in detail. And so he comes, and then he gives him the gospel, and then he gets saved. So he had enough of respect um, with regard to that. But you don't run across very many believers, or excuse me, you don't run across very many unbelievers that have this kind of attitude towards the Word of God that they would have not only a readiness of mind to uh, receive, but also that, uh, so you didn't have really any kind of barrier to the fact that, okay, God's supernatural, God's real, you know, that this book is actually supernatural and from God, literally, and that it's truth. I don't have to sit here and question it. So that all was already kind of done away with, so all you really had to do was just show them and then what they did was they verified on their own as to whether or not, wow, does, it, does this really say this in the Word of God? And then as a result, when they came across seeing that, hey, this is true, they believed. They received uh, Christ as their Savior. So this is Paul's methodology, Paul's methodology. So what is it that we can learn ourselves as far as in being able to approach now, mind you, this is in particular because this is, his audience was Jewish. We see he uses a similar pattern uh, when he deals with unbelievers. If we were to go down almost towards the end of the chapter, halfway when he's preaching to the pagans on Mars Hill, um, he's in particular addressing them to addressing the issue that they believe that God is an idol. So then his main thing with them is that God's not an idol. But here... Um, but he does. He does. Um, he does bring up the fact that. Um, well, go down to. Verse twenty nine, same chapter. Okay. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the God has like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art or man's device. In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. And here's why he tells them, you need to repent. Okay, Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him, speaking of that man that he's appointed, uh, that he's, that same man that he's ordained, um, that basically is going to be judge. Uh, and, okay, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. And then the response of the people, and then when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. How be it, certain men clave unto him and believed, among the which was Dionysus, Therapagae, and 
a woman named Damaris and others with them. So you had some that believed. Again, so he addressed, now he didn't necessarily quote scripture because they don't know scripture. So what he did was basically, he did reason with them, and he reasoned with them concerning some concepts. One, God's not an idol. Right? So God's not how you think he is. And here's what he is like. All right? He's greater, and in particular, uh, you need to repent of how you approach God, how you think you need to approach God. He's not just an idol. He's not some statue or whatever that you want to make that you bow down to, but rather you come to him on his terms. And the terms on which you come to him by is this individual that he's appointed. He's appointed a man that is going to judge. And this is speaking of Christ, basically. So you come to God by Christ, by means of Christ. And he addressed the fact that he raised him from the dead. So obviously he died, and then he was risen again. And so similar uh, pathology or methodology as far as when he approached uh, Jews that were unbelieving, but rather had knowledge of the scripture. And that was you open and allege concerning Messiah. Uh, you reason with them from out of the scriptures. Uh, in particular, you're going to be addressing the fact that Messiah needs to have suffered, died, risen from the dead, um, and that Christ is Messiah. Okay? Because he's the only one really that kind of would fit. He's the only one that would be able to do that. And then, uh, you can't really control the readiness of mind, but what you can do is you can at least try and set an atmosphere, whether you're in a formal setting or you're in a more casual setting as far as not to have distractions so that there would be nothing to go ahead and be an obstacle. Uh, but you can't really control their their readiness of mind necessarily. Uh, but you can pray towards that end, that there would be a readiness of mind, and that uh, that barrier that a lot of unbelievers have towards Scripture, that they don't take it as being the Word of God, that they don't take it as being truth, uh, would already be pre-removed, or God to give wisdom as far as being able to address those things, remove that so that you can just go ahead and pointedly address the fact that Hey, this is God's truth. Uh, Messiah needs to have suffered, risen from the dead, and that Christ, Jesus is the Christ. All right, well, does anybody have any questions? Kind mm -hmm. mm -hmm. well, of. I have a statement. Yep. You made a comment about God dying. Yeah. And I'm, from what I understand, I don't know if this is correct, but God can't die. So that's why Jesus had to come in the form of a man be the last blood sacrifice to be able to die for our sins. He had to be in a form that could die because by nature he can't die. Is that true? <laughs> yeah. Um, the only th the only objection I would have to that mm -hmm. is he, 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 never, he never stopped being God. <laughs> no, he stayed God, but I mean the yeah. human form of himself died. The physical part of him, of himself. Yeah. Bled and died for our sins. Yeah. But the God part of him, do you believe that God part of him died too? Well, he was separated, I know that, because he cried out. Yes, he did. He separated. But I don't know if... It's well, I, I guess I, that would be, that's the only thing I would have is because it's because... Death is not the stopping of living, it's rather just a separation. Right. So physical death is your spirit, your soul, separates from your physical body. Okay, so you, you're actually, your soul, your consciousness, your, your, your spirit and your soul don't actually stop existing. They just go from where we're at here to either heaven or hell. He said, God, into thy hands I commend my spirit. So... Did he ever really, the God part of him, did it ever die at all? The well, physical part, yeah, yes. But, I mean, he commended his spirit to God when he was on the cross. So, and Father, I mean. Yeah, but I, I know he cried out on the cross that he, he was forsaken. Yes. So he, he was forsaken by the Father. At that point, there was a separation, and then the sun turned dark. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, that part, 
that part I really don't understand as far as how you got Father, Holy Spirit separated from God the Son, even though they, he's still... I know his physical, when he come in his spirit, then he would go to paradise. He would go to Sheol, down in the center of the earth, and then from there he would remain three days, you know, three nights, and then he'd raise up again. So he, his, his physical body uh, would be reunited again with his, I guess, him, him his spirit, his soul, be reunited again with the body. So you had that. Uh, but as far as having the Father and Spirit separate from the Son, uh, that's a form because of that. He, because, well, it would have to be because it would be, there was a separation there. We're spiritually separated from God. We're born that way, though. Oh. Um, and it's only in. Oh, it's spiritually, only, that. Okay. Yeah. We're spiritually separated, yeah, because we, we, we're in the image of Adam, basically, now. But even though we're in the image of God, we're in the marred image of God because of we're born after the likeness of Adam now with, with our sin nature. So it's, it's only after we receive Christ that we are spiritually united again. So we don't have that barrier anymore. But um, how that works as far as you got the Father and uh, the Spirit turn, you know, separate from the Son uh, because He became our sin. Uh, <laughs> I know it happened because the Scripture says it, but I just don't understand as far as mm. how that works. And then there, there is, um, it just sounds weird to say, oh, God died. But that, I, whatever, I guess if you think it through, that's the only, I, I, that's the only way I can word it as far as how you can, now explaining how all that works, I really don't know. <laughs> Other than I just know that the, it's recorded that you have the Father turn his back. You know, the Father, there's a separation that occurred there um, prior to the physical separation when he commenced his spirit. And then he goes down into the, well, his body was put in the grave, but his spirit would already, at that point, whenever he gave up the ghost, he goes into, uh, you know, he goes to Sheol. He goes to basically the center of the earth. I don't know if I'm making sense or if I'm making, being more confusing. No, it's just another just, way of thinking, too. Um, <coughs> there's some question marks that probably until the other side I'll never really have answered, but, you know, it's. <laughs> that that would be the only thing I would have as far as like how to I can't make because there was more than just the physical there was that other aspect where why he cries out that you know he was forsaken by the father but I, I really can't really figure out how to I, it just for me it's difficult I'm sure I don't know maybe there's all kind of commentaries and books that are out there as far as that better explanation but I that's just. Um, does that really happen? Um, all right. Okay. Um, Joel is going to be teaching next week. I'm not actually sure what topic you're. Um, you're going to be teaching. Uh, the principle of readiness. Okay. All right. It's a little off the uh, the, the thread you're on, but. Oh, it's similar. Well, it's not really topical like this is, but it's a little, it's more of an exhortation. So it's still be good. Okay, awesome. Great. Looking forward to that. Uh, so Joel will be teaching next week, and then after that, I uh, was thinking of starting a series on, it's kind of similar to what Pastor has of the good examples and bad examples, but it's not just limited to the bad. Uh, the, I had a friend of mine wrote a book on unknown heroes and villains. And so it basically it's like character studies going through, okay, you got individuals that are in scripture that either did really bad stuff or did really interesting stuff that are like God gives commentary on it that it commends, but they're not like they're not like a David or they're not like a Saul or something. Yeah, they're just somebody that would be kind of again, as considered unknown, mm -hmm. but we can still learn something from them. All right. So I guess uh, no other questions. We're uh, dismissed. Okay.